Well, a very good morning, Grace and Four O'Clock Church. And also a very warm welcome to anyone else who is joining us on this Easter Sunday. My name is Andrew Coates and I'm part of the leadership team at Four O'Clock Church. It's good to go on meeting like this, isn't it? Where we can encourage ourselves in our faith and also learn about God. And for the regulars, there'll be a time afterwards via Zoom where we can catch up over a virtual coffee or a real one even and share our highlights from the week and chat about what we've learned. In view of where we find ourselves at the moment, it'll be good to begin with a reminder about the character of the God that we serve. In Nahum chapter 1 verse 7 we read, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And on this Easter Sunday, let's also remind ourselves about why we can rely on Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, it says, Jesus died for all, so that those who live should cease to live for themselves and should live for him who for their sake died and was raised to life. So let's now, in confidence, turn to a time of prayer as Caleb Nash leads us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that Jesus is alive. Thank you that death could not hold him. Thank you that he has defeated death no more to die. Thank you that death is swallowed up in victory and has lost its sting. Thank you that we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for the confidence this gives your people in the face of fear and uncertainty. Please help us live out the confidence we have in Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Amen. Lord God, we thank you that everything is under control. Thank you that you know what you are doing, even in this crisis. Thank you that you are always working your good purposes out. Please forgive us when we live as if we're in control. Please help us to trust you. When we're scared or worried or lonely, would we know you are with us? We ask you would be the God of all comfort to your people at this time. In Jesus' name, Amen. Sovereign Lord, we pray for Boris Johnson. Please would he have a speedy recovery. Please give skill to all the medics looking after him. We ask that Boris might hear the good news of Jesus Christ and that you would grant him repentance and faith. Thank you that you want all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We pray that Boris and many in the government would be saved as they come to know Jesus for themselves and submit to him. Please also give them great wisdom as they lead this nation. Help them to know what the right course of action is and to have the strength to carry it out. We ask for all the medics and those in the emergency services. Please keep them safe and cause them to turn to you for the ultimate safety. In Jesus' name, Amen. Finally, Lord God, we pray for the Finleys. Thank you for the safe arrival of their baby boy on Wednesday. We ask you would help him to grow up healthy and well and to come to know Jesus as his Lord and Saviour. We thank you for the reminder at Easter of the death and resurrection of Jesus. We're sorry for the ways we take Jesus and the life he offers for granted. Please help us always to focus on Jesus and remember his death and resurrection day by day. 
Please would we have opportunities at this time to make this good news known to many. Please help us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labour is not in vain. And we ask all these prayers in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. We're now going to look at this week's Bible passage. And in a moment, Emily Witchell is going to read for us. She's going to read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 42, to chapter 16, verse 8. And you might want to turn to that passage in your Bible. But as she reads, the words will appear on the screen. Mark, chapter 15, verse 42, to 16, verse 8. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter... He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Well, happy Easter once again to one and all. Let's turn to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that Jesus is alive. Thank you that he is reigning today. And thank you that we have his word. Please help us now listen attentively, help us to respond rightly, and to bring praise and glory to your name. Amen. In all the deluge of news stories about coronavirus, we may have missed the news of mad Mike Hughes dying last February. You may remember he was the chap who launched himself into the sky in his homemade rocket. Just two years ago, he managed to make 572 metres off the ground. But sadly, this year, things didn't quite go to plan and he ended up plummeting to his death. And there was a mixture of sympathy and pity in the press. Most viewed him as a weird eccentric, unsure if the earth was flat or round, a harmless if misguided man. And it struck me, perhaps Christians are often viewed in a similar way. A bunch of dedicated but ultimately delusional folk. The world basically tolerates the crazies, so long as they don't hurt or upset anyone else. But Christianity makes truth claims that cannot be ignored. In our current climate, people want answers. They want the truth. They want to know how long will the restrictions last. If there's a vaccine, we want to know, does it work or not? We want the truth. And Easter rings with the truth that Jesus is alive. For many of us, we'll be convinced of this. For some of us, we'll be a little unsure, still weighing things up. For others, we may be confident it's not true. But all of us need to examine the historical reports. And we need to weigh the evidence, but then take on board the implications. So the first thing 
we see this morning, and really it's the main thing, is Jesus is really risen. He really is alive. So turn with me back to Mark 15 and 16 if your Bibles are shut and just look at how Mark the author underlines Jesus is definitely dead. Back in verse 39 the centurion sees Jesus breathe his last. Now the centurion's one job here is to make sure Jesus dies. It's his area of expertise executing people. He sees Jesus die and then he confirms it to the governor. So just look at verse 42 again. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Joseph of Arimathea knows Jesus is dead, so he hurries to bury Jesus. But Pilate's not so sure Jesus is definitely dead. It seems a bit too quick for him. So he gets the expert in. And in no uncertain terms, he gets the message from the centurion, Jesus is definitely dead. And if we weren't already convinced, the body is then wrapped in linen that would have suffocated a living person. The body is then uh, sealed in a rock tomb, so no escape is possible for someone who's alive, let alone a lifeless corpse. I take it Joseph of Arimathea would have noticed a breathing body as he wraps it and lugs it to the tomb. But just every now and again, you come across what's called the swoon theory. The idea Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just kind of passed out and then resuscitated in the cool of the tomb. It got up, pushed the massive sealed rock out the way, incapacitated the guards and recovered from being whipped, nailed to a cross, having a spear rammed through his side, being deprived of oxygen for hours and hours and so on. But the Gospel accounts just won't let us take this view. It just doesn't stack up with the historical eyewitness accounts. Now Jesus is definitely dead. But also he's really risen. And we see it in the trustworthy testimony we're given. Did we spot how Mark labours the point to show it's the same people who see where Jesus is buried who go back on the Sunday? So verse 40. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. And then just skim down to verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early, on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. So we've got multiple witnesses who know the right tomb. It's light so they can see where they're going and it's not some made up myth. They don't expect to find the tomb empty, do they? They were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? This is no echo chamber where they just find what they want to find. It's not mere wish fulfilment. And even if there are any lingering doubts about finding the right tomb, the angel tells them they have. Verse 4, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. The angel knows they're looking for Jesus. But just in case they're slow on the uptake, he spells it out for them. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. 
It's staggering, isn't it? And yet conspiracy theories abound, don't they? Uh, have you heard the latest one about uh, 5G causing coronavirus? Apparently some folk are so convinced they're going around destroying 5G telephone masts. But this is emphatically not a conspiracy theory. In fact, I came across a poster online about how to spot fake news. It had an eight-point checklist. So I ran the gospel accounts through the questions. Consider the source. Check the author. Check the date. What are the supporting sources? Is it just clickbait and so on? And it all stacks up. Now, this is no April Fool's joke. Mark names and renames his witnesses. If we're making this up in the first century, there's no way we'd choose women as our main eyewitnesses. Their testimony was inadmissible in court back then. Now, there's only one conclusion that makes sense of all the data. Jesus is really risen. But we don't get the reaction we might first expect, do we? No, this whole gospel account ends in fearful flight. That's our second big idea this morning, fearful flight. Verse 7 again. The angel says, But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And this is how Mark ends his account. Verses 9 to 20 were almost certainly added later. And assuming that's the case, this, is, this isn't how weird choose to end it if it's making us look good, is it? Again, doesn't it have the ring of truth? Why you make your star witnesses do a runner if it's not true? Now, there is great courage shown by these women going to the tomb as they did early on that first Easter Sunday morning. But Mark's gospel is perhaps the clearest about the disciples' weakness. And it's no less the case here. These women have just been party to the greatest miracle in history, and they peg it. Before the resurrection, Jesus' followers have been told to remain silent, but didn't. After the resurrection, the women are instructed to go and tell, but they don't. But again, it's underlining the authenticity of the resurrection for us. Just think about it. After Jesus' arrest and death, the disciples, well, they are lost and helpless and afraid. Peter denies Jesus, the rest run away. In fact, this fleeing here echoes the disciples running away at Jesus' arrest. It's hard to think of anything other than the resurrection of Jesus leading to this ragtag bunch of people to share the message of Jesus in such a way it grew into the largest movement ever known to humanity. Now just think about it. Why would Mark deliberately not include any appearances of the risen Jesus? Well, because they're superfluous. You could just ask the witnesses. We've already been told the names of the sons of the chap who uh, carried the cross. Why? So you could go and check out their story. This is eyewitness history. Mark's gospel seems to end on a downer. But the mere fact we're reading it shows it's not the end. And Mark knows this. These women say nothing to anyone initially. But before too long, they tell anyone who'll listen. The fact there are millions of Christians across the globe today is undeniable evidence they did go and tell. Fear and faith have been two major themes in Mark's Gospel, and we're being invited to see why their fear turned to faith. Again, the only answer can be Jesus really is alive. And without their unwavering confidence in Jesus' resurrection, would the disciples have risked everything, and in many cases being killed for their faith? People do die all the time for lies they themselves genuinely believe to be true. It's impossible, however, to suppose all the disciples would die for something they all know to be a deliberate deception. One writer puts it like this. 
The church did not create the resurrection stories. Instead, the resurrection stories created the church. This fearful flight is only temporary. And there are hints of it in the text. Just look at verse 7 again. Why do we get Peter mentioned specifically? Isn't it because he was the one who denied Jesus three times? Jesus predicted everything in advance. He said Peter would deny him, and he did. He said all the disciples would flee, and they do. He said he would be crucified, and he was. He said he would rise again, and he does. Back in chapter 14, Jesus says, After I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Mark doesn't spell it out, but leaves us to join the dots. Jesus did go ahead of them to Galilee. He keeps his promises. And here it's a beautiful picture of restoration and recommissioning. You see, Peter getting singled out in verse 7 shows us there's hope. Peter the denier will be restored and forgiven because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And just like Peter, we too can be forgiven, even the worst of sins. If Peter can be forgiven, then anyone can. Before the cross, all are guilty, all the disciples, uh, the whole council, all the company of soldiers. And yet after the cross, we get glimmers of grace from each of the groups. The centurion soldier, uh, Joseph from the council, and Peter, the representative for the disciples. Weak people like you and me who failed to live for Jesus as we should can be forgiven. Is that not great news? The resurrection proves Jesus is God. It proves all of Jesus' claims are true. It proves we can be forgiven. He's taken the punishment we deserve. And it proves Jesus can take us through death to be with him forever if we're trusting in him and his death in our place. Mark deliberately ends his gospel like this to hold out hope. The resurrection gives us hope. Death has been defeated. The empty tomb shows us death has been defeated. It is the only explanation. And so it means Easter isn't just a nice story. No, it is the most staggering, most life-changing event in history. It gives anyone and everyone confidence in the face of death if they're trusting in Jesus. As I've looked over these words again this Easter, I have found them so reassuring. On the face of it, it's a disastrous ending. But the angelic words in verse 7 are a promise. Failure is not the end for the disciples. And it's not the end for us if we're trusting in Jesus. Having verses 7 and 8 together right at the end it gives us the model of the Christian life according to Mark. A word of promise and the failure of the disciples and yet the word of promise prevailing despite human failure. Isn't this so true in our experience if we're a Christian? The resurrection gives us hope and specifically it gives hope to weak, fearful failures. And it encourages us to strive in God's strength to stick with Jesus. And Joseph of Arimathea gives us a little snapshot of what that looks like. Mark, the author, loves to use sandwiches as a literary device. He has a story on the outside and then the filling in the middle. So can we see the women in verses 40 and 41? And then again at the end of chapter 15 into the beginning of chapter 16. They're like uh, the bread in the sandwich. And then the middle, the filling in verses 42 to 46, focuses in on Joseph of Arimathea. And as we look at these verses, our final point is bold belief. Bold belief. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, 
took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he placed a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Here is someone who doesn't allow fear to stop him identifying with Jesus. He's looking for the kingdom of God. He goes boldly to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. I imagine that would have been a pretty terrifying thing to do, don't you? Easter holds out the most wonderful hope. Full forgiveness and eternal life for any and all who come to Jesus and trust in him. All fear of death removed. But Easter also says if we want to follow Jesus, then it means taking up our cross and following him. Almost exactly 75 years ago, on the 9th of April 1945, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian and pastor, was hanged in a Nazi concentration camp. And famously he said this, When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Easter isn't just reassuring, though it is the most comforting news anyone could ever receive. It's also challenging. Again, quoting Bonhoeffer, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. Maybe we identify with the fear of the Marys and Salome. They, they flee in fear. And whilst there is grace and forgiveness for failures, it's not where we're meant to stay. Joseph is bold and courageous in his discipleship, and it's also costly, isn't it? He goes and buys linen to wrap the body. He uses his own family tomb. If we're a believer, will we allow Easter, the fact Jesus definitely died and really rose again, will we allow it to shake us out of our complacency and serve Jesus with great boldness and at cost to ourselves? And whether we're a Christian or not, and don't we find it interesting in the responses we get here to Jesus, there's either fearful flight or bold belief, but not apathetic indifference. That option's not left on the table. If Christianity is untrue, it's unimportant. If Christianity is true, it is of infinite importance. The only thing Christianity can't be is of moderate importance. And just the other day I saw a, a meme about the relative importance of things before and after coronavirus. And the gag is, well, things like the internet has rocketed and uh, shaving has tumbled in importance. Coffee remains the number one priority. But actually, infinitely above all these things, the importance of Christ and his resurrection remains. If Jesus is alive, Christianity means everything. If we're a Christian and we feel like we're treading water or, or we're going through tough times or we're just not sure it's worth it. This here tells us it is worth it. Jesus in his love offers what no one and nothing else in this world can offer. I like our Queen very much. She assures us we'll get through this crisis. We will succeed. But sadly, some won't. She can't guarantee everyone's going to make it. Or, or Donald Trump. Trump says, anybody that needs a test gets a test. They're there. They have the tests and the tests are beautiful. Except they don't have enough tests. Leaders make bold claims. But no world leader has ever promised to abolish death. No organisation can guarantee eternal life starting now and lasting on to the other side of the grave. No one offers complete forgiveness of sins. Dealing with all the guilt, all the shame, dealing with God's righteous anger. Seeing how frail we are reminds us the gospel is all about Jesus. But knowing it's all about him, what he's done for us through his death and resurrection, motivates us to serve him faithfully and boldly. And when we fail, well, we come back to Jesus and remember the grace we have in him. And once again, we're emboldened to live for him and speak of him more and more. 
Jesus is alive and reigning today. It is true, he definitely died and really rose again. He is alive and reigning now. His death was sufficient payment to God for our sin and his resurrection proves it. Death has been defeated. It no longer holds any fear for those trusting in Jesus. It's given me great confidence in the face of this crisis, not because of me or anything in me, but because of Jesus and the fact he's defeated death. So this Easter, let's cling to the risen Jesus with a fresh enthusiasm. Jesus rising from the grave proves he's God. It proves all his claims are true and it shows us why it's worth trusting in Jesus, worth putting all our weight on him. It's worth letting him call the shots in our lives. And it's worth serving him with boldness and costliness. It's worth it when we're suffering. It's worth being persecuted, worth battling sin, worth saying no to self and worldly desires, worth putting Jesus first day by day by day. If all of this is uh, new to you or, or you'd like to find out uh, more or you've just got questions or maybe you're familiar with the thing, these things but you just want to chew them over, well please do get in touch and we'd love to help you uh, look at God's word. As we close, uh, we might have seen the clip doing the rounds of uh, George W. Bush speaking way back in 2005. And he says this, leaders at every level of government have a responsibility to confront dangers before they appear and engage the American people on the best course of action. It is vital that our nation discuss and address the threat of pandemic flu now. There is no pandemic flu in our country or in the world at this time. But if we wait for a pandemic to appear, it will be too late to prepare. And one day many lives could be needlessly lost because we fail to act today. And it's a reminder not to wait until it's too late. You see, Jesus is alive. He gives hope in the face of death. But don't delay. Don't wait until you're on a respirator. Don't delay. Don't fail to act today. Jesus is alive. The empty tomb proclaims it. The eyewitnesses testify to it. The evidence of the church today proves it. So trust him today. Take him at his word today. How will you respond to Jesus' life, death and resurrection? The resurrection is real. The resurrection means restoration. And the resurrection revolutionises it. It motivates us for bold service of Jesus. When Christ calls a man or woman, he bids them come and die and live. Let's pray together. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Lord God, we thank and praise you so much that the resurrection is real. Jesus really is alive. And thank you, that means there can be restoration for sinners like Peter and sinners like us, that Jesus' death has worked. The payment has been accepted. It is finished. And thank you that Jesus' resurrection from the dead also motivates us to a bold belief, to costly, self-sacrificial service of Jesus. We pray today that we would be rejoicing in Jesus' death and resurrection all the more and motivated by him to serve him and speak of him all the more. In his name and for your glory we pray. Amen. 
As we close, can I remind you, if you're a regular, that we now have a catch-up via Zoom for a virtual coffee, and you should have received details during the week about how to access the meeting. If you haven't yet dropped into a session, it's a very good chance to catch up with what's been going on in both churches and to pray in small groups. There's no obligation to uh, arrive at any time and you can log out whenever you wish. It'll be on for about an hour after we finish here. So as we draw to a close, let's repeat together the final words from Matthew's Gospel, like we've done in weeks before now. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen.